Welcome to Right on the Mark with your host, Mark Young. Today, I'd like to talk about brushes with greatness. It probably all started in the late 1980s, uh, early 90s. I was in my early 20s, and uh, there was a lot of stuff going on in the Mon Valley, and one of the big ticket items was a boxing match. Back then, the mills were booming, the stores were booming, uh, just a lot of activity all over the place in the Mon Valley, but this particular instance was a first, is my understanding. It's a first boxing match in history at my alma mater, Madison High School. My father-in-law at the time, the great Dr. Thomas, he was good enough to land me a job with NBC. NBC was a great company to work for. While working with NBC, I was able to see a lot of the inside stuff that went on behind the scenes. It was a three-day gig where I worked over the weekend preparing for the boxing match. So it was the day before, the day of, and the night of preparing for this match at Manesson High School. I want to say the year was 1988, and I worked for some people at NBC. I really can't remember their names, but uh, they treated me very well. I was called what was known at the time a gopher. So that I thought was pretty funny as... My title for NBC was a gopher, but that's exactly what I was. Whatever they needed, I was supposed to go out and fetch for them. Uh, them coming from NBC, I want to say they came out of New York. They didn't know the area that well. They didn't know where the airport was. They didn't know where their store was, the hardware store. Uh, they didn't even know where the local uh, food places were. So my job was to get whatever they wanted. However, the title of this podcast is Brushes with Greatness, so I don't want to get into detail working for NBC, but the main headline there, the only headline was uh, ex-champion Michael Moore, the boxer. Uh, I was able to get up close and in person with Michael. really don't remember who he fought at the time, but I believe he knocked him out within a couple of rounds. Uh, but uh, that was my start. That was the early start of Brushes with Greatness. Going forward, I was able to meet a lot of other people some of the people that worked the matches were Marv Albert and Ferdy Pacheco. Uh, they were the actual announcers, and uh, they were staying in a local hotel uh, in Bel Vernon. And uh, one of the producers of the match says, Mark, would you mind going out and picking them up? Can you go pick them up? I'm like, absolutely. I'll go pick them up. Where are they staying? He gave me the directions to the hotel. I picked them up within 15 minutes. And as soon as I pulled up, they were in the lobby waiting for me, and I uh, walked them out to the car. To my surprise, they both sat in the back seat. I thought it was odd. I thought one would sit in the front and one would sit in the back, but they both sat in the back seat. Uh, very friendly gentlemen they were. Got in a lot of conversation about sports at the time. Marv was uh, broadcasting Nick games back then, uh, but he did boxing as well. Ferdy was strictly boxing. He was a color commentator analyst, uh, and but they they spoke to me, you know, most of the way there to Manesson. Probably the biggest concern was how long does it take and I said probably 10 to 15 minutes and they were okay with that uh, whenever we got close however uh, we did have to pull over and they had to get out and walk because of the traffic at the Manesson High School due to all the the crowds and stuff that was going on because like I said this was a first event uh, one of the things I do want to note is uh, I did have to stand guard the bathroom while Marv had to fix his hair uh, I did have to run and get them food and drink uh, as a matter of fact, one time I took too long for a hamburger for Marv and I brought the hamburger back. Maybe it was a half hour later and he threw it right out in a garbage can. So I was kind of shocked at that. He said it's just a little too late and he's not hungry. So he pitched it in a garbage can. So, uh, yeah, that's how that went. Uh, but throughout the years after that, uh, you know, I've met a lot of other uh, famous people in the area, traveled a few places to meet people. You know, I've met a lot of wrestlers. Uh, in my time, I'd go to a lot of wrestling events down in Pittsburgh, uh, local areas too. Uh, some of the people I could remember meeting them in hotel bars after the match. Greg the Hammer Valentine, uh, the British Bulldogs, uh, the Hart Foundation, just to name a few. Uh, even Hulk Hogan was there, which I mistakenly thought was superstar Billy Graham, which was really odd. But he was wearing a bandana covering up his bald head. And I was going to call him Superstar, but I'm like, no, I think that's Hulk Hogan because Superstar was well retired after that. One thing I do remember very vividly is uh, my wife, the lovely Kim, came along with me to meet the wrestlers. And uh, her sole purpose, I believe, was to meet Hulk Hogan. Not sure if she really talked to him, 
but she was able to reach out and grab his arms. So to this day, I still hear about the 23 inch Python arm that she was able to grab. And that's one of her stories as well. So uh, yeah, that was one of her brushes with greatness, but uh, I can go on and on about wrestlers. Uh, you know, it was a really good time. It was really good years, eighties and nineties. That was very popular for uh, WWF at the time. Uh, but there's other sports that I, I ran into a lot of people. Uh, most notably, I'd say one of the long conversations that I had was with George Carl out of Penn Hills. Uh, he used to coach the Seattle Supersonics back in the 90s. And I met him a few times and I'd meet him. I think they were both up in uh, Cleveland. Yeah, I think they both played against the Cavaliers. Uh, so I would uh, take a picture with him. And then the next year I went back and he signed it. Uh, we talked a little bit about Penn Hills, which he left on a sour note, which I really didn't know. But... He said all they want is money from him, so he never visits home uh, at Penn Hills. So uh, that's the reason that he doesn't go back. So I thought that was very interesting. Uh, along the way, uh, sticking with the NBA, uh, the Rifleman. Uh, I remember going with one of my friends that I used to work with back in the 90s. We took a train to Boston. Uh, it was great. We went to the Garden. We saw the Supersonics play the Boston Celtics. And uh, one of my favorite basketball players at the time was Chuck Parson, also known as the Rifleman. Uh, I do remember it warm ups. Uh, he accidentally booted a basketball and we had really good seats down below and it came my way and a ball seemed like it took forever to get to me because what went through my mind is, oh my God, the ball's coming to me. What am I going to do with it? I have to do something memorable. So the ball finally rolled to me. I turned to my buddy like I was going to throw it to him up in the stands, but I was quickly bum rushed by security. So they're like, no, you have to throw that back into play. I'm like, okay, well, here we go. So I fired it back, an awesome chest pass back to the rifleman. And I like to believe, to think that he thought that was a great pass. So uh, that's how that went. That was pretty fun. So uh, he turned around, spotted up for a three, which was long distance back then, nailed it. And I briefly said under my breath, the rifleman trying to stay on basketball uh there was other players that i've met i mean i've gone to a lot of college games uh i've met mookie blaylock stacy king kind of the same thing has gone on you, you get good seats the ball rolls out and you and you pass him the ball and that's a story to tell uh, i didn't really get a chance to talk to him but you get a chance to to see him uh however there were a two there were two uh good basketball players in the 80s that i was able to play basketball with uh one was charles smith who went to the nba and uh rod brooken uh, i don't think he was drafted in the nba but he was part of the 19 i want to say 87 86 class somewhere around there it was very powerful pit they had you know, they, they had Jerome Lane. It was shortly after Sam Clancy, and they just had all the parts. I mean, that one game that I see them, that I seen them beat Oklahoma, Oklahoma was rated number one in the country. Pitt was third, and they beat Oklahoma. Uh, they won a Big East that year, but they never went far in the tournament just because of the officiating and how tight they, they call those games down the stretch. But uh, I thought that was very interesting, just uh, me playing basketball with them. Would have pickup games. Uh, I'd go visit my then girlfriend at the time. And before she got out of class, I'd always get there early. And there was always games at Trees Hall at Pitt. On Pitt University is where she went. Uh, so I'd meet my cousins up there. And he's like, hey, why don't you come up and we'll play some basketball. Little did I know that I'd be playing with ex-NBA players and some college players as well. Perry Kemp, professional player. Played up there a few times. Uh, there, I want to say uh, Julius Dawkins was there, a professional football player at the time. I remember him showing up. One memorable uh, pickup game we had is uh, Rod Brookins was checking me the whole game, which was really fun. Uh, it was really fun watching uh, Rod Brookins and uh, him watching me. Uh, I did score that game. Uh, however, he wasn't on me at the time, but uh, it was one of my highlights because uh, if anytime you could score on a potential NBA player, boy, that really makes you feel good. So uh, that's how that went. That was a really good time back then. Uh, we're talking late 80s. Uh, and there's also been some football players I ran into. Uh, one of, Probably one of my biggest uh, moments was uh, running into Billy Ray Smith, uh, former ex-linebacker for the San Diego Chargers at the time. Uh, it was early 90s. And uh, one funny thing about that is I asked Billy Ray when I met him, I said, how's everything going? Are you feeling okay? Are you going to play? He's like, yeah, what are you talking about? I says, well, I just want to know if you're going to be able to play. And 
I insinuated the whole season, but I don't think he thought I meant that. He just thought how I was feeling at the time. Which was funny was the next game I saw him at, uh, he got injured, and then he he shortly retired after that. So I thought that was funny that I asked him how he's doing and how he feels for the season. And he said, great, why wouldn't I? He gets hurt the very next game, and then he retires never to play again. So uh, I thought that was quite interesting. There are some baseball players I ran into over the over uh, the uh, the eighties and nineties. Uh, probably most notably in the uh, mid eighties was Ken Griffey Jr. He was out of a small town in I think it was Denora. He might have graduated from Ringgold, but he was out of Denora, and there was a, a batting cage in Charlotte that everyone went to. And one time, uh, my friends and I went down to the batting cages, and somebody showed up in what I want to say is a convertible Mercedes. Now, during the time, I didn't realize that it was Ken Griffey Jr. because he had his son with him. So Ken Griffey Jr. didn't actually take batting practice in the beginning. He worked with his son. After that, he took batting practice, and you could just tell he was a professional baseball player. Uh, We only said hi to him. We really didn't talk to him, but it was a very very memorable uh, batting cage session. Keeping it probably up to date, my last person that I met is Jerry West. Met him on a way to, I believe it was probably Indiana. Uh, might have been Indianapolis to be specific, but I met him on a plane. He was heading to L.A. and uh, he was sitting in first class with myself. And uh, I knew it was him. I th- Well, I shouldn't say I knew it was him. I should say I thought it was him. And then after other people were talking about him on the plane, I'm like, yeah, that is Jerry West. Uh, I kind of thought it was the ex-pit football coach. Uh, but he turned out to be Jerry West. I can't think of the ex-football coach that uh, that he looked like, but uh, uh, that name escapes me at the time. But uh, I finally got to meet Jerry West after the flight, and I talked to him, and I told him where I was from, and I didn't really follow him live as he played, but I knew he was the logo, and I knew what he stood for, and I knew what he was about. So I did want to say hi, shake his hand, and I was able to get a selfie. One other famous athlete I failed to mention that I met, I'm not sure when it happened, it was either mid or late teens, was I was at a Manesson High School game, and uh, my father, he said, Mark, Doug Kuzan's up near the concession stand. I said, what? Doug Kuzan's at the concession stand? He's like, yeah, I just saw him. I went to go get a coffee, and I just saw him. And back then, I was a Miami Dolphins fan, and I ran up to go see him. And first of all, it's hard to tell because you watch these guys with pads, helmets, and uh, all this garb on, and then you see them as a regular person with none of that on, and it's hard to recognize them. But I think I faintly did recognize that it was Doug Kuzan at the time, and I was able to shake his hand and told him I was a big fan of his. Uh, I probably want to say I was a late teenager, so I was pretty bold talking to people back then. Oh. And here comes the lovely Kim. Yes. What are you talking about? Talking about Doug Kusan and when I met him. Weren't you with me? No, it was not your late teens because I was not there. Sorry, I don't remember that. Come on. No. (laughs) It was not. I think you told me that you were probably like 10 years old. And anyhow. (laughs) 10 years old. You weren't a Miami Dolphin fan while we were dating. Oh, so you're telling me I said something wrong? Clearly. Well, once again, what are wives for? <laughs>